Okay there, School of Tomorrow students. As you know, if you follow this somewhat chronologically, we sort of sort of plug along at the high school level for the most part with branches into higher and lower grades. You could say K through 16 is a, a way I've mapped it using a fork at algebra to divide math into algebra into um alpha excuse me into delta calculus and lambda calculus that's one of my more famous videos you could say uh, lambda calculus i'm kind of taking it from its smaller sense of a very specific lambda calculus alonso church um language game and expanding it to encompass really computer science you could say i'm using lambda now to stand for computer science with all necessary um, tip of the hat or more, almost uh, a bow to LISP and the functional programming and the use of Lambda there, uh, how we understand anonymous functions, very small part of Python, but vital even that way. So high school level, Lambda calculus, in other words, I'm on the computer science side of that math track more than you're used to. Now the Earth's energy budget is how we wire up to what we call general systems theory. As I was talking about in previous videos, we're looking at, in a science fiction sense, the building, when we're really building hydropower dams. We being humanity collectively, that goes on, right? And the global grid is something that's in the news all the time, different fragments of it, right? So in that sense, we're just following the mundane everyday news. We're learning how to read the important scientific literature or whatever engineering, right? So that's the general systems theory aspect. But then there's the science fiction layer that I brought in and bring in revolving around so-called ETs or Martians or whatever. And this just has to do with recognizing that there is an alien aspect to some of this thinking. Right, And I tried to bring that out in the last three videos by taking the traditional approach on the left and the synergetics approach on the right. It turns out on the left, the dodecahedron has a typo in it to begin with, which is extraneous to the point I'm making. So mentally change that three in the denominator to a four. It doesn't really matter in terms of what I'm showing. In other words, I'll fix that issue when we get to it in the last video. You may, though, be wondering, on the right side here, these seem to be static numbers, whereas on the left, we have E as a variable. So how am I supposed to get from this set of fixed-sized polyhedra with relationships to each other to any size polyhedron? And the answer is very much it's like the E3 term. You can add that back in. We call it frequency. We tend to use the letter F. But volume goes up as a second, uh, excuse me, third power. So like if you have a tetrahedron of unit volume and you double all the edges, that's E2 now, or whatever we want to call E. And uh, so we've just gone up by an eightfold in volume and so on. But you can go any fraction, you know, you don't have to double something. You can phi up, letter phi, uh, golden mean. You can use the golden mean, apply it to every edge of a module in synergetics, like a T or E module most likely, or S module and have that same shape, keep its shape, all the central and surface angles stay the same. Shape and size are two distinct, you could say dimensions or aspects of something. So relative size also is important in the canonical arrangement of the concentric hierarchy. So this is the kind of math that we get to through literature in a lot of ways. Like we're connecting our general systems theory Here's the last three videos, by the way. The last three sort of made a series. I went back to and made them part one, part two, part three. Because that's an important part of the curriculum too, right? It's where we put up the XYZ and IVM side by side, the way I put it. XYZ now just stands for the whole of conventional cube-based rectilinear ultra-orthodox thinking. And on the right, or the other way of talking that I've introduced here, 
using more tetrahedrons, that's unorthodox, literally not focus on orthogonals as much. So it's a different namespace is how we put it across. And when they come real close together and we can actually jump in between them and compare and, com compare and contrast them tightly in a close observant way, that's a lot of the value of this curriculum comes from doing that. It's not like we're saying you need to, need to jump ship and leave behind all that other math. It's not like that. It's just, hey, we can come up really close into this kind of an alien uh, way of thinking about a lot of conventional math. And through that, we kind of, that's what we call sort of talking to Martians or learning the Martians thoughts or whatever we're doing. The Martian is, is getting in here because it's unusual. But what it really does is it descends from the Buckminster Fuller syllabus, which is hardly that hard to get into, right? I mean, that makes sense. I'm pushing it out now to OKRU, which I notice the OK written sideways cleverly also looks a lot like the good old OX of, um, you know, the pirate, the, uh, the skull and bones of the one lap laptop for child um, I'm talking about this logo up the top left here. The one laptop per child thing is, let's see if I can get my page up. I'll show you what I mean. I, early on, my website started to be mirrored in Iran, but that's, I can't find that anymore. But those were the good old days when things were going well in the sense of universities getting bright students and things chugging along. Now we're kind of in a, a vortex. I encourage a sort of SimCity version of what I call asylum city that factors in a lot more realism. It's more like refugee camps or a cross between a 24-7 sort of <clears throat> set of theater performances. There's a lot of sound stages, but there's also guild areas where people do crafts and learn from each other. But remember, a lot of, a lot depends on sanitation. What if there's an outbreak of dengue fe fever? I've been catching up on that. You know, when you have large crowds like at Burning Man just sprawling across a place, how much separation there is, you know, you can always fathom the worst or imagine the worst. And in a simulation, that's okay. Like, what if we do get an airborne disease? And what is the mosquito population in this place? And what do we do to mitigate that? Like, is there some giant dome that's mosquito-free? Have we ever <clears throat> tried to build one of those? I'd say there's a lot of sort of experiments ahead of us. And that's partly why the universities need to tool up and get ready. Because prototypes on the way, right? More than we have so far. We have some prototypes. But this need for large, sprawling asylum cities isn't going to just dissipate overnight. What with climate change and all... People need to get out of the way, even if the bombing stops. Even then, we still need asylum cities. So keep that in mind. That's what this curriculum helps you get towards, moving towards. Also, clean up. You know, you want a career in clean up. That's what we're thinking about, too. In the School of Tomorrow GitHub site, there's a lot about radioisotopes and the whole history there including with some good matplotlib and other such Python-related skills. Pandas, I think you'll find. So poke around. There's a lot of this is not just YouTube. So a lot of this is online, and it's not that linear. I don't try to because people are joining us all the time. So it starts fresh every time, but also explores what becomes a well-known namespace for you. Like, I'll dive into Codesters and do collision detection in the next video. And I've done a lot of Codesters before, and it's not like that's way off topic. It's just a different topic. So enjoy, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.